Welcome to this edition of Dustin's Kaleidoscope. I'm Dustin, and today I have the pleasure of being here with Neil Chambers, who is the CEO and founder of Chambers Design. Thank you so much for being here, Neil. My pleasure. <laughs> um, so we are going to talk a little bit about your background and about Chambers Design. So first of all, Chambers Design is can you explain what it is? I so, won't guess. You just so yeah, it. the way that I like to describe it is contemporary design company that's based in research. So we a research-based design company. And what we do is architectural design and we focus in, on sustainability and green buildings. Okay. So for our viewers who are not familiar right. with either sustainability or green, can you explain in layman's terms? Sure. What that is? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, let me get, let me kind of back up a little bit and help it because I always give a little bit of background. Okay. So, um, green building came out of this idea of sustainability, and this, the whole and sustainability kind of grew out of environmental awareness. So, how do we live on the planet more with a smaller footprint? How do we use less energy, less less water? How do we use materials that have that are non toxic and stuff like that? And so. Um, green building kind of really comes out of that. So the, the goal of green building is to is to build buildings or cities or infrastructure that has that is more aligned with the the, the natural world and also ha takes less from the natural world. Okay. So for example, um, when you're thinking about uh, the types of material to use, does that mean that you will use materials that are found locally, or does that mean materials that won't destroy the the current the the current yeah, geography I mean, it, you or know, like, combination? So, like some 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 kind of typical ways that people think about materials, non-toxic materials, so things like no, non-VOC or uh, so non, I'm sorry, non what? Non-VOC. Yeah. What is that? The, yeah, green building is full of jargon. Just let you know. So <laughs> VOC is a volatile organic compounds and. These okay. can be carcinogens or other types of toxins that so that that new fresh paint smell yes. is actually toxins coming out of the paint and that's when you get really? a headache. Oh, yeah, okay. so non-VOC paints don't give you a headache and they don't smell. So when you walk into a house that's been painted with non-VOC paint, you don't even know that's been painted except that you can see the color is rich and vibrant. So okay. those those are some things you, you mentioned local materials. That's also a big thing about sustainability. Because local materials take are usually take less energy to get to a site. Um, they're supporting a local economy, which is also kind of part of sustainability. Uh, recycled content's another piece, uh, or something. Uh, you know, everybody knows what recycled content is. Uh, rapidly renewable materials is another thing. So things that will re regenerate within ten years. So not hardwoods or like you know you know rainforest trees or stuff like that, but instead things that like cottons and wools and stuff like that, which will, or bamboo, which will come back. So these are quickly. things that are almost like compostable in a sense, or do you mean that they Because They, they, they do sometimes, com, you know, them being, um, you know, biodegradable or compo compostable go hand in hand because you're, you're working with things that are less processed, basically. Okay. Yeah. So when, so you, can you give us an example that of, a project that your company has done that yeah, has so been both <clears throat> sustainable and green? Well, yeah, I mean, the goal is to, yeah, I can. Uh, so just kind of give you another little bit. We do a lot of big buildings. Um, we do, our projects usually range um, between 100,000 square feet and up. So we, we're usually okay. doing big, big projects. And, and uh, is a, I, I'm, sometimes I, can't quite. So what's a hundred thousand? Is that like a Costco warehouse? <laughs> yeah, that would be about a Costco warehouse. <laughs> okay. Yeah, All yeah. Right. Depending on how big it is. Yeah. All um, right. So we're it's talking a, big. It's really talking big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a big, big buildings and big buildings. The reason we're that's really our sweet spot because um, they take a lot of energy to run and we know how to help reduce the amount of energy they need. Um, 
a good example, we're, st we're finishing a project now. It's for a client that's in New York City. Uh, they're built, they're, they are proposing a, a million plus square foot uh, building, which is like wow. an entire city block basically. Okay. And they wanted to see if it was net, if it could be net zero. And net okay. zero just means that the building would only use as much energy as it could produce on site, right? <laughs> yeah, so like, that's kind of, and that's where sustainability is really going. That's where green building is really going. And so it being in New York, an urban area, yes. makes it really difficult to do that. You're on a confined site, which also constrains the potential of being at zero. It's a mixed building, a mixed use building. So it has a lot of different uses in it. It's not just residential or just commercial. It's residential oh, and commercial okay. and hospitality and a lot of other stuff that's going on. So what we did is we, the reason we're research-based is that we don't just pr start to propose solutions. We actually want to work with clients in a way of saying, let's figure out what's the best solution. Okay. So we don't come to the table. We, we come to the table with like a bag of tricks, but, those that, but it's not necessarily defined yet. So we're not, we don't think about style first. We think about solutions. And we do this research and analysis. And what we found with this project um, is that we could reduce, we could eliminate 93% of its energy costs every year, which represents over a $3 million of energy cost savings every 12 months. And that's all based on the materials that you choose and yeah, the like type of... Yeah, like materials, your energy power. systems. So like a building uses a lot of energy. The biggest kind of is if you looked at a pie chart of how a building uses energy, okay, half of it would go to heating and cooling and lighting. And the other half would go to things like plug loads, fans, pumps, these kinds of things that most people don't really care about. The really unsexy stuff. But right. So what we're trying to do is find ways to really, really make heating and cooling the most energy efficient. And that has a lot to do with the skin. So a building's exterior yeah. is really the kind of, if you think about it, it's, it's the place where if it's not done well, you have to use a lot of energy. And if it's done really well, you can, you can reduce your energy um, in, um, use by 20 to 30%. Just annually. I mean, yeah, annually, just from your skin. And then wow. that will help reduce your, your, your mechanical systems, um, which are usually 20% of your, your budget. So if you really start to save on your skin and everything, it starts to help reduce the first cost or the construction cost. Which is the exterior, which you're talking yeah, yeah. about. Sk then. Yeah, skin envelope, skin envelope and facade all mean the same thing. It, okay. it basically is the outside of your building. So. Sometimes people, when they think of like green buildings or sustainable buildings, they think, well, that's nice, but they're not going to be very attractive. Or inside, they'll have the half like dim, you know, <laughs> dimly lit light bulbs and stuff like right, that. Right, 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 How right. true is that? Or is that completely false? I mean, or is that more of a 70s type of Well, I, I would idea? say that um, green buildings should be better than any building you've ever been in. It should look better than any building you've ever seen. Okay. I mean, that's the real challenge, I think. I think you, it's, you know, from my perspective and the way that we approach projects is that you have to have, like, the quantitative stuff, like we're talking about energy use and stuff, but you also have to have the qualitative stuff. It has to have a soul and a spirit. You want to feel like you're somewhere. You know, you can make an office building when the have some of the greatest spaces, you know, that you've ever been in as long as they're designed well. So... If you go into a green building and it doesn't look good or it's boring and it doesn't, it's not <laughs> lit well, it's a bad building even if it's green. So, you know, like we don't want to just make bad green buildings. We want to make like really amazing green buildings because I think that the goal is to attract people to sustainability. That's like, I want that building. That's what I want to do. That's how yeah. I want to design my building. And we do a lot of hospitals um, okay. and healthcare is an area that needs a tremendous amount of um, attention around sustainability in better spaces, quite, quite honestly. And, and are you saying that because of the, uh, because there are patients there or because of the fact that it's medicine and the, the types of things that you would have to do in a hospital or So, I mean, think about it. If, if every hospital in the United States saved 20% on their energy bill yearly, that would save over a billion dollars to the overall healthcare industry. 
So when we talk about like we should save money on insurance and all this other stuff, like if if, if hospitals were just more efficient, you could mm. take out a billion dollars of cost. Just annually. Just over. annually, right there. And that's about design. The other thing is that um, hospitals use more energy per square foot than all other buildings except one type. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. So they wow. every and the only one that you, only type of building uses more energy than um, hospitals is fast food restaurants. <laughs> so like the idea of like how you know why is why are hospitals only getting beaten by fast food restaurants when they should or they could become the the you know the 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 way in which all buildings can be designed. I mean, hospitals are very complex. They got lots of equipment and stuff in them. But if you can design hospitals really green and efficient, it would make it makes all other building types so much easier. Wow. So, what are the types of things that you when you when you I, I'm assuming that when you approach a hospital, it's already a hospital that is a, a standing hospital, or are you talking about hospitals that are current that will be made in the future? We do a lot of new construction. Okay. Um, but we do, you know, it. The principles that we apply to new construction can be applied to existing buildings, and you can get the same results. I mean, so... Um, so I'm curious, like what kinds of... So for an existing hospital, since you said that, you know, second to fast food restaurants, they mm -hmm. use the most energy, mm -hmm. what types of things do you introduce to um, an existing hospital? And we just have a couple minutes, but... Sure. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there, the, the, you know, there's simple things like lighting. You can, um, you can read, look, you can look at your lighting, but also look at. Uh, you got to also back up because hospitals, the history of healthcare in hospitals is that they used to be a place where you went to die. Okay. So, healthcare and hospital design comes from that's their history, you know, that you that uh. people were isolated in them. And so there's all these regulations about infectious control because you don't want people to get, who are sick getting other people sick. So there's ventilation requirements that you have to adhere to. And most when you can't open windows and there's certain amounts of lighting that are necessary. And the way that things are have to be heated and cooled are very different than in other buildings. So, you know, approaching those things, one of the things that we try to do automatically is look at how can we connect the patient to the natural world. So what, that's one of the big things, views, daylight, uh, materials in um, patient rooms that are more you know, stress relieving than, instead of stress causing, colors. Um, these are just some of the things that we would do to start to help kind of work in the um, green features for a hospital. Okay, that's thank you so much. We're actually gonna come back because I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the cost involved. Sure. Um, and so we'll be right back. This is Dustin from Dustin's Kaleidoscope. We're here with Neil Chambers from Chambers Design and we'll be back in a moment. Local government, local educational institutions, and local community members all use cable access TV to communicate their message. They depend upon it as an affordable means of outreach. Public, educational, and government access television empowers local government agencies, individuals, and groups to use the media to speak directly to their constituents in a more direct and cost-effective way. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local PEG channels. Hi, and welcome back to this edition of Dustin's Kaleidoscope. I'm here with Neil Chambers of Chambers Design, and before the break, we were talking uh, specifically about hospitals, and I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about costs, but um, I know that in your book, Urban, can you tell us a little bit about your the name of the book? And, sure, sure, Because sure. I think that encompasses some of the, the cost aspect of it. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the book's called Urban Green Architecture for the Future. I, r I started writing it, um, gosh, probably in 2000. Eight, I guess I sat down. I wanted to write about kind of. Um, I felt that the conversation around sustainability and green design was getting a little bit too conventional in some ways, and that solutions that were being offered to the public weren't necessarily um, wouldn't necessarily uh, work if you kind of looked at them as a long-term goal. Oh, okay. And also, I wanted to look at um, 
you know, buildings, so my background is architecture and looking at building specific projects, but we've also done larger urban design projects and, and also ecological restoration projects, habitat restoration, and working on these bigger scale projects, I started to really see that, that some of the things that we said were green in a building don't flesh them don't flesh out on the larger scale and like the kind of the components of how buildings are related to infrastructure and things like that. No, well, why is that? So why would there be a disconnect between what people perceive as being green or what is thought to be green and the actual building or the Yeah, well, so I mean there's things like, you know, um one of the things so cost is always a big issue and I guess just to touch on that really quick is, is that a green building shouldn't cost more. You know? Okay. I, I really don't think it should. I mean, now that's under that's with the understanding that what you're trying to build that building at is at a place where you're you're going to get a certain type of building. I mean, if you're just bare bare bones, you could see an increase. But even even that, um, that's not always the case. Okay. So, but what I was looking at were bigger issues around like water, energy. A transportation, these kind of topics that um, that are, I think a lot of people are talking about, you know, cars and emissions, um, infrastructure, people, I think around the country, the U.S., is that there's this big debate about how we're going to improve our infrastructure, how are we going to renew our infrastructure, and how are we going to do it in a budget-restricted um, future. Okay. And what I started to see with um, some of the work that I was doing was that there were big infrastructural solutions that cost a fraction of what people were suggesting. Oh, and so it was like okay. this whole opportunity of like, we can renew cities, we can change the way regions work at a fraction of the cost. I mean, literally the fraction of the cost. And so one of the examples, um, we started doing this project in South Carolina in a place called Myrtle Beach. Okay. And we were doing oyster restoration. and. Um, we started this, this estuary, it's called Withers Estuary, and it's one of the most polluted bodies of water on the East Coast. And, the, and it used to not be. It used to be where everybody went to learn to swim. It, was the, it actually is where Myrtle Beach started. The first post office was on the banks of Withers. The first oh, house okay. was on Withers. But there came, it's, it's gotten so dilapidated that Almost no one under the age of 60 knows that Withers ex is there. So it's like, I mean, it's literally like it's in the middle of the town and no one knows it's there because it's so hidden and it's so dirty. So what we started to do, we looked at um, what could we do to improve the quality of the water and we found that oysters would be something that could do that. And the reason for that is that oysters can filter four gallons of water every hour. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it's it. They're they're like these little bitty like vacuum cleaners of um, badness, I guess. You know, like, and there used to be billions of oysters up and down the East Coast in the Gulf of Mexico, and so over the last hundred or 110, 120 years, they've basically collapsed in eighty five percent of their um, habitats to where they're considered um, functionally extinct, meaning they don't play a role in their ecology anymore. Okay. But they're keystone species. Okay. And what a keystone species is, is that it's a species that holds together an entire ecosystem. Oh, so without them there. So without them there, you start to have collapse yeah. of other species like mammals and birds and aquatic uh, vegetation and all this other stuff. So we were like, well, let's restore them. Let's put them back in. And so over the process of, and we're still doing this, every, um, every year we started restoring the reefs in Withers and over and when in this, did you start this you said in 2000, we started it I mean I guess we started eight, in 2007 seven, okay. but then you know we really start I think we put our first uh, reefs in in 2008 and every year since then we've been putting a reef in and now like the first reefs have oysters all over them and the wow. new reefs are like and so there's this whole idea that that project has cost us almost nothing I mean the the truth is like the first few years is all volunteer you know, we're working with the Coastal Carolina University um, that's in South Carolina and, you know, with a guy there named Dr. Keith Walters and he's a oyster expert and it's all been volunteer and this whole idea that to scale it up, what I started to realize is that we have, so oysters not only clean the water but they protect the shoreline, uh, they stop storm surges, they, um, 
they help erosion. They create um, places where fish can fisheries so you can replenish uh, fish populations. Um, they sequester carbon, so they're a, car they're a climate change solution. There's, uh, they, they remove nitrogen from the water uh, column and from the habitat, which has all these other negative, so like things like algae blooms don't happen, so you don't have all these fish kills and stuff. So they have all this tremendous effort and, there's, and you can replace them at almost no cost. And so what that started to do, and that's why I started writing this book, my book uh, in Urban Green was about that, was about how there's all these solutions that have big impacts and they're at a fraction of the cost. And that our conversation today about sustainability and things like, you know, I'm, I'll talk about LED lighting and, you know, I'll talk about <laughs> materials all day long to my, I'm blue in the face. But the truth is like, if we really want to look at like big solutions, they're out there and they, and they don't cost that much money. And that's really what I want, that's what the book's all about. And it kind of lays all that stuff out. So Ur Urban Green sounds like it is the, uh, the architecture of just a green or sustainable society as opposed to piecemealing it with a hospital here or a bu building there. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but this is sort of a blueprint of yeah, it's everything like, yeah, it's together. Kinda, exactly. I, I, I tried to write a book that's like, here's all the pieces. Here's what does work, here's what doesn't work, you know, here's what we know, what we don't know, and let's start looking at this on a on like a national scale or a global scale of putting things back into place. Now that means that you have to change the way you think about what a city is and where cities are placed right. and what, you know, how we move from point A to point B. And so there's changes, but it actually improves our life. And when we think about how we're cash strapped as a society, you know, with debt and all this other stuff, it's like there's ways that in, can improve the lifestyle and quality of life for people, you know, throughout society, and that can be long term. And that's really what I was kind of trying to talk about. Okay, and uh, just want to mention it again: Urban Green. And where can people get the? So book? we have a Facebook page. So it's, you know, Facebook.com/backslash Architecture for the Future. Architecture for the Future. Yeah, all one um, word. And Urban Green, can I get it on Amazon? Yep, can you can buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, mainly online is the best place to get it. Okay, and, and other than your free Facebook page, do you have another website? So, uh, you know, ChambersDesignInc.com is my company's website. Okay. Um, it's a great, you know, you can get all the information there. I mean, there's other um, sites as well, but I think those are the two big, you can get it. You know, okay, the Facebook, the Facebook page. Facebook page for the book, the and then the uh, ChambersDesignInc.com for my company, which has a, a bunch of different projects we've worked on. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to get back to the Oyster Estuary. So you just demonstrated that there's a pretty inexpensive solution to a pretty big problem. Mm -hmm. Why don't more people? Why why isn't it that more people aren't actually? Gra is it because they're ignorant of, you know, that something that simple can create such a, a huge positive change, or is it there's an easier like well, way? I, mean, or I got my theories. I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't want to sound crazy, <laughs> but like, <laughs> I think it's it kind of boils down to two things. I I think first, infrastructure has always been thought as like heavy infrastructure. You got to build a dam or a road. Oh, okay. It's got to be something really heavy, concrete and steel intensive. Right. And that's what infrastructure is. You know, like a power plant or you know, like a big wind turbines. There's these. It's something. It's got to be big and steel or metal of some sort. So I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing is that we're just not educated. There's no education about like, conservation biology. Um, oyster restoration kind of falls into conservation biology, and so. You know, trying to, you know, like I always say, architects shouldn't be designing buildings. Ecologists should. You know, that's the that's what really should be happening. I mean, it shouldn't be, you know, uh, you know, engineers engineering infrastructure that kind of goes all over the landscape. It should be, you know, biologists. It should be ecologists that are like really getting in there to help people understand how to sustain and keep together this kind of natural world that provides clean water and clean air and a whole list of other ecological services for free because that's really you know if we're talking about a society that's going to last for the next hundred or two hundred or thousand years 
You need somebody who has that expertise who can help you understand that everything hey, the yeah. oysters are in everything there. has to kind of start from a conservation biology perspective, right? And grow out of that. So I think the problem with I don't want to say problem. I think one of the things that we're just beginning to really see these are all new concepts. You know, like these are not a hundred year old concepts. You know, um, evolution theory started in 1859, but you know, healthcare medicine didn't really catch on and start using it as a basis for me, you know medica medications and things for another 80 years. Architecture, engineering, landscape design, uh, all the you know regional planning, city planning. It's not even really discussed as a serious topic in those disciplines yet. And so I think that's why it's not seen as like the first go-to solution. Right. And so like when you start to really think about, you know, unfolding and unpacking this idea of what green building sustainability can be, it's really, a, that's where it really should be the goal. That, that's the big goal, the kind of the, how do we restore the natural world? All right. Neil, we have about a minute left. Okay. What would you, first of all, I want to tell everybody again, your book is called Urban Green. You can get it online um, at your Facebook page, which is? It's facebook.com backslash architecture for the future. Okay, and your website is? chambersdesigninc.com. So before we leave, what could an individual do today to help with this whole the greening and um, the greening movement, so to speak? I think there's a couple of things. I mean, you know, definitely how, you know, if you're a homeowner, like what can I do to make my house more sustainable, more resilient, more climate adaptive? Those are kind of the questions that I, I think about and I think other people should be thinking about, especially post Superstorm Sandy. Yes. You know, how, you know, how can I never lose power again? How can I always have at least, so I think those are some of the things. I think other things is like, you know, environmental issues and, and these kind of bigger issues are about the community. So it's like finding organizations within your community that need and want that volunteer help. I mean, I really, I'm a big advocate for that kind of stuff, like get involved and then like, you know, bring your expertise, find solutions and then start applying those. Great, thank you so much for being here today. Um, Again, this is Neil Chambers of Chambers Design, um, and his book is Urban Green, and you can get this online. Um, thank you so much for this for being here for this edition of Dustin's Kaleidoscope, and we'll see you next time.